You should explain about Keelan as well. Yeah, we should just mention that Keelan couldn't Keelan. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So just to clarify, I am not Keelan from The Guardian. Apparently, her flight is not coming in until 2 p.m. And funnily enough, I was asked yesterday at 11 p.m. <laughs> I found a message in my, in my direct messages um, on Twitter to help and now apparently moderate this panel. <laughs> but um, today we're going to talk about finding creative ways to make your own data sets. And we're going to um, bring to the table two other wonderful experts who are going to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Carrie Kyo. I am a data journalist. Um, I work for the Irish broadcaster, RTE, in Dublin. Um, I've been doing data journalism for about uh, eight years. And um, before that, I worked in London for a long time, working for The Times and Reuters in different places. And I'm Gavin Sheridan. I'm the co-founder of a legal intelligence startup called VizLegal. I was the, in the founding team at Storyful, which was the world's first social media news agency engaged in open source intelligence. And I started doing data journalism about, God, about nine years ago, nine, ten years ago. <laughs> and I'm Lambo. I'm not Caitlin, as we've established. I work for BuzzFeed News, where I specialize mostly on um, gathering social media data to find a way of understanding society, technology, and now politicians, apparently. Um, and um, I have worked in every capacity that is not the main thing at different organizations, from Al Jazeera at a TV station where I was heading the interactive team, all the way to um, Planet Money, where I was doing economics um, reporting not on radio, even though it's a podcast. And now I am um, doing mostly data at a place that is known for doing listicles about cats, BuzzFeed. Um, OK, so I think since uh, I have some of this material in my head, <laughs> I think we're going to start with the short history of data journalism, as imperfect as it may be. So please don't think that this is the definitive history. But I think there's uh, value in bringing the idea of how did data enter the newsroom um, to this table. And like one of the one of my favorite anecdotes is who here has seen Spotlight, the movie? Yeah, Oscar-winning movie, right? Um, one of my favorite people in there is Matt Carroll. He's like the ultimate um, original data guy to me. Um, and he, one of my favorite scenes in there is him putting together the very first spreadsheet that the Boston Globe had had. And he put in all of these different names of these um, Catholic priests and so on. And there's this dramatic swoop over that um, Excel spreadsheet. But for me, it was really exciting because it was one of the very first times when people were using a statistical approach or a data approach to figuring out a systemic problem. And um, I would say that maybe it was like in the 90s when Excel became this very popular software that um, also made it accessible, that made statistical analysis accessible to the masses on some level, that maybe data journalism has kind of entered into more general like day-to-day -day news. And um, with that said, I think uh, it would be really helpful for um, both of the panels to also speak about how it was in their country when data journalism came about and um, how they're using it. So, uh, you know, when WikiLeaks came out, I think it was like 2011, the Iraq war logs, I was actually in Dublin at the time and I was working in the National Library and I saw this incredible story coming out in The Guardian and the, you know, um, we saw this amazing detail all over Iraq about where people are dying and I was like, this is, this is what I want to do at my life. So I moved to London and I trained to become a data journalist. And I think like WikiLeaks really changed the like data journalism in London. And it was, then it was at the CIJ, the Center for Investigative Journalism, where people like David Donald, who's a legendary trainer, and Aaron Pailhofer came and they, they trained an entire community of people. And from there, like I went to Reuters and I've just kind of grown that way. But um, before that, I, I didn't even understand the history of it. I didn't know about Philip Myers. I didn't know about the work he'd been doing like in the 60s and 70s. And I didn't know about legendary people like Sarah Cohen, who just, and Jennifer LaFleur, who've just like been shaping this in the US and then coming to the UK and training. Um, it's been like fascinating. Yeah, so um, I guess I have a similar story. I didn't start doing data journalism until 2009. <laughs> Um, and that was partly because I went to the same Centre of Investigative Journalism summer school in London. And um, the community was still quite nascent, I think, at the time as well. And also the first, 
uh, the first data harvest festival that's on in, in Belgium that I was at was in 2009 as well, I think. And it, that was a very small room of data journalists, much smaller than this room. Um, it was, I think, like 12 people. Uh, and and I was the, Helena Benson was there, who was, who was formerly of The Guardian. And uh, we were in the room kind of discussing how we're going to do this. And she asked a question about how to map coordinates using addresses. And I was like, well, we'll just use Google Fusion Tables. And she was like, what's Google Fusion Tables? And we were like, oh, well, let's, let's figure this out, how to geocode data. Um, in Ireland, in the Irish context, uh, I guess when, I, when we started doing it with myself and Mark Coughlin in 2009, there wasn't really a community of data journalists. It was, it was people just messing around with uh, pulling together data. Um, certainly the first, we, we started a blog in 2009 focused on, on investigations. And the first project we ever published was essentially tabulating um, all of the donations to all of the Irish politicians over the previous decade, which was an exercise in data journalism in one way, but it was also a lot of manual work in order to pull various document formats together, put it into a standardized spreadsheet so that you could get an overview of it. And when we published it, nobody had actually done this before, and we published it, we published it all in one go, and the first response from our audience was, can we give you guys money to keep doing this? Um, which was a really interesting and new thing that people were saying, like, well, can you just put up a PayPal button and we'll just give you money to just keep doing this? And then the second thing we approached was the, the fundamental problem, which is a lack of data, generally. If you, if you love data journalism, sometimes there's a lack of actually any good data out there to do anything with. So we took a very specific approach around using access to information law to get data from government in a systematic kind of coordinated way. Um, and we were reasonably successful doing it, but it's a long, hard slog. Um, so what I'm hearing here, and I want to get a read of the room for a second, is that a lot of us taught ourselves. I came from doing humanities and actually studying German and Italian, and then taught myself how to do a lot of data journalism because someone told me to. Um, but uh, I want to get a read of the room. Who here has actually used, let's say, spreadsheets or data in their stories before? Okay, a few, oh, that's good. Um, okay, so based on that, how, how do you think government data right now fits into the larger spectrum of data? I think one of the things that happened in the past few years is that we went from just what is given to us to kind of going rogue and building our own data sets. And I would love to first get the fundamental problems that we face with government data on the table. Uh, it's mostly wrong. <laughs> And that, that is the problem I come across time and time again. Um, and it's only until you call up the place and you hassle them and you say, are you sure? I mean, this number looks kind of odd. Do you want to <laughs> check that with someone? That they come back, they're like, oh, yeah, that was supposed to be a two instead of a 250. You're like, oh, Christ. Um, in Ireland, one of the problems is like I work with a lot of departmental data from the government, and it comes from all the local authorities. Now. The issue is that nobody seems to have gone and talked to the local authorities and been like, here are the definitions for these columns. This is how you're going to count. Instead of unique, like you're going to do unique counting instead of multiple cases. Um, and so a lot of the time, the numbers aren't really real. And I spend a lot of time researching and trying to figure out what are the problems, what are the holes. And I actually find Irish government data less reliable than UK data. Like once I get it, I, om I automatically think it's gonna be wrong and spend a long time rebuilding it, reshaping it, talking to experts and trying to figure out what are like the unknowns and then from the experts having the known unknowns and trying to fill in those holes. Um, I guess there was a movement in 2010 like and onwards around governments implementing open data policies or strategies it's highly variable, um, and it has been for years. An awful lot of the problems with open data uh, government policy is that an awful lot of it seems to be PR or marketing by the government to say, hey, we're being really open and we're publishing all this data. The problem is usually it's crappy data, it's not newsworthy data, and it's safe. It's safe to publish. And you're like, well, usually that's not the most interesting stuff that you could that you could be interested in. A lot of it isn't open data, it's open statistics. Yeah. And that just drives me crazy. Can you elaborate <laughs> on that? Yeah, instead of getting like, uh, I, I, instead of, if it's environmental data, instead of like having the raw regulation, so you, you go and you get like water testing limits and geo coordinates uh, or pH levels or whatever, 
and you have like row, 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 row of CSV, CSVs, like hundreds of thousands of them for all over Ireland. Instead of that, they'll just like throw some statistics at you and be like, open data. It's like, no, come on. Yeah, or else they'll say open data, but please tick this box in order to, uh, you know, give your consent to that you won't do anything bad with this data or all this kind of stuff. Or it's like open data, we've just published some PDFs. And you're like, well, okay, that's, <laughs> that's not, oh, there's tables in a PDF. You're really making my life easy. <laughs> or in my case, if you, F if, you free if you send a freedom of information request to a government department and you look for their financial management system to data dump their entire expenditure into a spreadsheet so that I can analyze it to see how much the government body was spending, they print it out and send you the spreadsheet in paper format. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, uh, and that's just, and sometimes that's just to tell you we're in control. Uh, and yeah, of course you scan that data back in and you then try and convert it back into a spreadsheet, which is a really enjoyable project. <laughs> I, I have seen beautiful binders that we've got from <laughs> departments with like little labels and everything. And it's like, why, why have you done this? And someone's put like hours of work into it. And I think, I think actually from a data journalist perspective, I think one thing, one piece of advice I could give is understanding, especially when it comes to government, when, when you look at any government body in any country, invariably they use databases. And understanding what type of database, what f software they're using, how easy it is to extract data from that database is, is part of your tool set for how you might do data journalism projects in the future. So I'll know through public tendering data that a specific government body uses Oracle as their software for managing money, right? A lot of the manuals for how you use and export data from Oracle is online, and I can understand at a fairly fine-grained level how uh, Oracle software works. Therefore, when I, when I file a freedom of information request for data from that database, the public, the public, public authority can't exactly tell me, oh, we're not able to do that, or it's, it's really hard to do that. I'm like, well, I'm looking at the manual here, guys. I could do this in, in like five minutes, so you can't really block me from getting this data. So to summarize, I think some of the key findings here are um, what we get from governments, it sounds like, is mostly summary data. So a census, for example, is um, a population count of a state or a country or of a county, but that's summarized data from thousands of different surveys, right? And so what it sounds like is that um, what you guys should look into is like when you see a summary table, don't stop there. Work your way backwards into seeing where did the data collection start? That can be a form, as you said. For example, the census is a physical form that is given out to people to fill out. That gives you a name, the demographic information about someone. Before you even FOIA anything else, FOIA the form. See what kind of information, what survey they've been asking, uh, what survey they've been using to ask people, so that you get an idea of what the raw data is, right? And then the other thing it sounds like that. Um, um, that we all agree on is the idea that once you have this raw data that you get hopefully from the government You need to figure out a way of querying that data for the findings that you want Because it sounds like a lot of the summary data we get is either completely neutral It's like it's a population count or here look at us. We're doing so well if you want to be able to interview your own data set you need to have the raw data and then the tools to figure out how to find your own findings. You need, you need the data dictionary. You need to make sure you understand every single definition and ideally talk to the statistician who's worked on it because they want friends. They don't get to talk to people that often and like they get excited sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 think, I think for me it's, uh, it's my, my, my biggest gripe is always how you get it in the first place. So, okay. and, and usually it's one, it's usually true FOIA or else the second one is obviously scraping. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, back in the days of, of the early days of this, of this stuff, there was Scraper Wiki, which was one of the early kind mm -hmm. of platforms for crowdsource scraping. Um, but I think scraping from my own company now as well, we scrape a lot of data from, from lots of jurisdictions in various formats from PDF all the way to uh, XML. And it's, it's interesting dealing with public body websites. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's go back a little, let's zoom out a little bit. I want to hear about two, one or two methodologies that you've used to get raw data from the government. And I, I have a good experience actually, so I can share that too. 
Um, so thanks to Gavin and another guy called Connor Ryan I work with, I learned about the reuse of public sector information. Um, and I managed to get some really fantastic data from the Medical Council in Ireland for a story we're doing looking at uh, medical consultants who are not fulfilling their public hours and who are kind of exploiting the system. Um, and I, I got this incredible data set. And you know, when I first sent in the application to the department, they were like, uh, what is that? And it's like, you, they had to Google it to see that they were under it. And then they've been fighting with me over FOI. And once they realized they were, they just sent me everything. It was pretty amazing. So wait, to summarize, you looked at a law that the, this government body had to abide yeah. by, and they didn't even know. They had no idea. And then you were like, get me that data. Is that it's correct? an EU directive, yeah. Okay. yeah. How about you? Yeah, that, that directive applies across the union as well. It's applied to various degrees in every member state. To, it's called the Reuse of Public Sector Information Directive uh, 2015. It's the most, the re most recent version. Um, for me, I, I guess the, the, the first time I ever did a FOIA related to data was uh, back in 2009. There was a controversy in Ireland about a specific uh, government department overspending on a particular minister traveling around the world at great expense to the Irish taxpayer. And it, one of, that, that, was, that was the traditional story that you go after the minister to see, you know, how much money is being spent, where is he going, that kind of stuff. But I was interested in, and this is, goes to your point as well, is that when, when, you, when those FOIs were released, they were actually printed pages from an Oracle system. And I was really interested at, in, in a URL that was at the bottom of, this, uh, of these printed pages. It was, it was actually an intranet URL which describes the location and software that was being used in the context of um, the, the data that they were releasing on printed pages. So obviously my next step was, and this was a multi-step process, it took about a year, um, we sent a FOIA to the department saying, um, could I get like the list of all the, the cost center numbers and the names of all the people who've received expenses in this particular department? And they kind of wrote back and said, you know, for what period? And we said, well, since you installed the database. Um, and they kind of wrote back and said, no, we can't give you any of that because you know, it's personal information or it's, it's, it would, it, somebody might hack us if we released that kind of data to you, which was crazy. So we appealed it all to the information commissioner on that, on that, on that issue. And the information commissioner obviously found in our favor and said, we got a CD-ROM in the post saying, here's all the data for all the people in that public body who've ever claimed an expense, uh, including every single time they claimed something, the name of the person and their uh, job title. Um, but we were on a path as well to set a precedent about how you do that overall for the whole country. So once we had one example of it being done, and I think we were the first to use that particular technique, we then went to 12 other departments with exactly the same request, looking for exactly the same thing from, from all these other public bodies, which ended up with us getting, I think about 4 billion euros of expenditure per person of expense claimed over the previous three to five years um, in enormous detail about understanding how money is spent by the state. And then the second thing that flowed from that was once we had this principle that we could get data from financial management systems, the second one was, okay, let's not think about expenses by civil officials, by public officials. Let's look at raw expenditure by the state itself. So when the, when the state buys a table or a, a laptop or a car or an ambulance or whatever it is, that's all recorded in a financial management system. So I'd like to get all the data about actually your ven the vendors who's selling stuff to the state, how much do the state is spending on it, how much is depreciated by over time, um, who are the suppliers. That leads to lots of other lead, lead generation when you're looking at how um, state contracts are awarded. And then the third one is emails are fascinating because <laughs> most of the Irish government departments, and it's the same in many jurisdictions, use Microsoft Exchange slash Outlook for communicating with each other. Uh, if you sit down and read, or sit down, buy a Microsoft person pints and get them to explain to you how Microsoft Exchange Server works, and then file a request querying their Exchange Server for emails between certain public officials, between certain dates containing certain words, or just do trawls through the entire database looking for words that were used by any official over a period of time. Because ultimately, Exchange Server is like your own Google search engine where you can file FOIAs directly in with queries. Now, public, of, public bodies will spend an enormous amount of time trying to block you from doing these types of requests. But it's, it's having this data first principle because one thing that's changed since the days of Spotlight is that governments have shifted from paper-based, generally, to complete email, computers, 
databases, everything is stored somewhere electronically, and that should make our job easier, yeah. especially when laws like the reuse of public sector information directive exist. I'm going to put in one more example, then I'm going to try to, again, summarize what we said so that you guys can come at, uh, out of this with bullet points. There was an interesting, we, uh, you guys probably have heard of the Me Too movement in the US that has sp spread throughout the world now. And one of the things that's really difficult to do with sexual harassment, which is one of the main um, complaints uh, that women have voiced uh, through the Me Too uh, movement is that is really difficult to measure. And there's actually very little data out there about that. And um, one of the commissions in the US, the EEOC, the Equal Employment and um, Opportunity Commission, has complaints by people who have filed federally how much um, um, of, of employers who are sexually harassing them. What's interesting is that they actually don't put out that many um, um, summary tables explaining where, which industries are the worst and not. And one of the methods in which I actually got raw data without a FOIA Ooh. for every single sexual harassment data claim um, filed with that uh, body in the past 20 years is by telling the statistician, I know what your job is. I know how you can come up with these summary tables. Why don't you give me this, this, and this, and this result? Or you give me the raw data and I do the job for you. And that actually got me the data. That's amazing. <laughs> and so I think there is like, I think there is, sure, there is an, uh, sometimes there is an adversarial relationship that you have with government bodies to get certain data. Sometimes it's a matter of saying, this is actually your job. You should be following this law. Why aren't you collecting this data? And then they start doing that. Or sometimes it's really coming down to empathy and being like, I know your job is hard. I know exactly what you do. So let me do that with the data that you have and give it to me. And since then, there have been like a few academic studies based on that data set. It's, we published it, um, BuzzFeed has a very lovely open data policy where we publish our data um, for free on the internet for people to use and um, other journalists have used it and so on. But I think there is something to be said about the different methodologies to get the same data and it all comes back to tracing back what kind of data they should or do have based on knowing the law yeah. or knowing the software that they use to store it or knowing what they already published and what the forms are or what the, what the data is based on and then really going ham on people and being like, okay, so I know this is your job. I know this is how I can help you do your job or you can help me do mine. Does that sound about correct? Yep, yep. If you can get past the press office, you can meet some really interesting people. Yes. And, you know, they're kind of the unsung heroes as well. A lot of them public servants. And they, they believe in what they do. And they're just like, we have someone we can talk to about this. This is wonderful. <laughs> they're like, be my buddy. And they, uh, like, uh, one statistician, like, will call me every now and again and be like, how did you get on with that? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you get no. text messages from your statistician in the government. Hi. No. How's Not it going? Quite, How's the data going? <laughs> how about you? Um, I, think, I think there's one other thing, other point I'd make about government data is, is Put yourself in the shoes of a civil servant or a public official who comes into work every day and imagine what they look at on their computer, right? Because sometimes it's not necessarily the databases, the big data that you're looking for. Sometimes it's the small stuff. So an example I'd give is I was doing a, f a FOIA request for um, leases between a government body and companies. And they gave me the lease registry. So actually understanding that lease registries exist is interesting. Which I got a, I got a, a like 10 pages of paper showing me a table of all these leases the state had entered into. But at the bottom, again, it's all looking at the details, it's the footer. In the footer was this network address drive, uh, which was m colon slash, um, you know, documents and settings slash uh, something or other slash FOI slash Gavin Sheridan slash the request I was seeking, right, which was where the document lived on their network. So an obvious thing when you're looking at that is, well, now I know that there's an M drive, which is a network drive in the department. I know that there's these folders in their folder structure that contain lots of interesting information. <laughs> so I'll FOI the FOI folder to get all the FOIs of everybody else because they haven't published them, right? But the, the detail is you're, you're thinking about how the information is held at a fundamental level, not just in databases, yeah. but when, when, when a public official comes in and sits down and turns on computer, they're using Windows just like you are, right? They're using folders, they have to organize their lives, you have to understand, and there's post-it notes on their computer, and there's, they're, they're coming in and doing their work. 
And if you put yourself and kind of empathize with that view, you can then understand how you can FOI stuff related to whatever they're doing that you're interested in. And that, that goes to what browser did they use? Is their browsing history stored? Am I interested in browsing history of a certain public official? Um, is that data under FOI? Yes, it is in most jurisdictions. Um, so if you're thinking about the routine tasks that public officials have to do, whatever that is, whatever your area of interest is, whatever story you're investigating, kind of bearing all that in mind is that they're in the same position you are really sitting at a computer every day. Yeah, that's beautiful. All right, so we have now covered government data, um, but one of the most interesting things about uh, that is also that governments don't have to collect data unless they're obliged to, right? By law or by some other sort of like interest in it. Um, and one of the things that I find particularly exciting now is that more and more journalists, as we, we become a larger data community, um, are creating their own data sets. And why don't we start? There's like, I think there's like two or three ways in which I want to kind of group it. One is manual data collection. The next one that I want to cover after that um, is crowdsourcing. I think that would be an interesting way of like plucking at information. And then the third one is scraping and social data and uh, data from the web. So why don't we start with manual data collection and uh, making your own data sets? So unfortunately, I end up, you know, building data sets manually a lot. Um, because the data I want just doesn't exist. Um, and just one example, uh, a couple of years ago, I worked on a project with the ICIJ called Fatal Extraction, where they had a team of people and they got someone to scrape the Australian Stock Exchange for all mining companies. And then a couple of us went and we went through the annual reports of all these mining companies and we extracted a couple of pieces of data. If they are working in African states, what they were extracting, um, what their tenement holdings were or leasings were, and how many people died or were injured on those sites. And so, and this is all an annual report, so I think there was two or three of us that did this. And we found that something like over 350 people had died and that Australian mining companies were behaving in a way in African countries that they were not allowed to in Australia. But that was like this massive manual building project. We, we've done a couple of more at the Times uh, and Sunday Times we did a story where we went through the annual reports of charities and we pulled out all the salaries and we found out how many CEOs of charities were earning like 200, 300,000 pounds. Um, you have to be really organized, you have to be meticulous, you have to accept that there is gonna be an error rate. You are gonna make mistakes, you are gonna get tired. No, it doesn't matter how much coffee in the world you drink, everybody gets tired. And so it isn't just about removing the information in a systematic and structured way, um, you have to have a verification process where you got to have a buddy who's going to check what you do when you check what they do. Um, and that's, to me, that's kind of the only way you can kind of do manual work safely. Um, yeah, actually, Keelan, who's not here, uh, was working on a project that I helped out with as well, which was a big, uh, it was herself and Cynthia in the FT. They did a, a project around how the European Union grants are spent. That was back in 2010, 2011, I think. Yeah. Um, so e the, the EU distributes money to member states to spend on projects, usually through the EFSF, the European Structural Funds, or through the, the other one, there's, there's two big funds. And it's a lot of money, it's tens of billions of euros are, are distributed to member states to spend. The problem is, there are, each member state is obliged to publish this information about where the money is spent and who gets it. It just depends which country you're going to, how it's published, right? So there's no standard around it has to be published in a CSV. So I think it was Spain was publishing all of its uh, EFSF money uh, data in PDFs. And there was uh, tens of thousands of pages of PDFs in tables <laughs> that required conversion. And as you said, it's prone to error. And you get tired and it's exhausting. Yeah. I, think I, I think I did like 15 or 20,000 pages <laughs> uh, manually. And I was using Abbey Reader, which is one of the better OCR uh, software for identifying tables at the time inside, inside PDFs. Yeah, as you said, manu that kind of manual stuff can be really difficult and yeah, it's error prone it, as well. It's physically and mentally it. exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> like it really is. Um, but just don't be too hard on yourself because sometimes that's the only way you're gonna get really good stories. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point to make, like that a lot of this data is actually incredibly prone to human error yeah. in many ways. And like that, oftentimes it will take a lot of manpower to get a data set together. One of my favorite examples of that is actually La Nacion did a lot of, um, received a bunch of PDFs basically uh, on government data. And then they did 
um, datathons with retirees and students where, <laughs> where they had a specific system set up where people would take information and double check what the software would put into the system mm. so that you would have two or three layers of humans to check back on whether your programmatic har harvesting of PDF data was actually right. That's great. And I think that's a really, like there are methodologies that you can use to make sure that you can have two or three layers of fact checking to make sh uh, to, to, to kind of bulletproof your data a little bit more. But I think what, what this comes back to is that um, in many ways, a friend of mine really blew my mind one day and she was like, interviews are done on a massive scale over and over again by someone else. And really the accuracy of that depends on that person, that government mm -hmm. body, that, uh, that, that agency, that NGO, whoever put it together and whoever, the, whoever placed values on those questions also is accountable to the accuracy of that. And sometimes that just means us going back and checking their work, right, mm -hmm. and doing it mm -hmm. manually. Um, the next thing that I'm interested in is also like sort of like, I don't know how much you guys have done in that realm, but like figuring out tips, crowdsourcing, figuring out how to find data through other people um, as well and like doing a little bit of like, or even stuff that you've seen on the, um, on that other people do that you think uh, is admirable. Even if it's not statistically sound, how can that be helpful in like figuring out tips or just doing a massive crowdsourcing thing? Um, I, well, the, the, the platforms that you've seen built to these crowdsourcing things, sometimes they're, they're data-ish. So uh -huh. <laughs> um, Amnesty had a really good project recently around uh, identifying oil spills uh -huh. um, in Nigeria. They were using, I think, a New York Times open sourced uh -huh. platform for doing that. I haven't done any specific projects around that myself, but one thing I do know about crowdsourcing related to that is publishing, publishing the raw stuff has enormous benefits. Um, because a lot of your audience sometimes will know more about the subject matter than you do, or ever will, because it might be that person's job. Mm -hmm. And in cer in certain, in certainly when, when we were running the story.ie, we would spend a lot of time publishing original documents and original data and asking, what did we miss? Is there something in this data that we didn't, we didn't see the significance of, or we saw something that was significant but wasn't as significant as something else? And then somebody will just leave a comment going, by the way, have you seen this particular thing in this particular line? that's really important and here's mm -hmm. why. I think that can be really powerful because sometimes I think there's a reluctance by journalists to actually share the raw material sometimes. Um, and I think you can, you can benefit a lot. And I, can, mm -hmm. I guess that comes from a blogging, a blogging culture as well as where you, that was the default situation that you would mm -hmm. do that. Yeah, I, I haven't used crowdsourcing too much, but um, definitely trust and share other journalists. If, if you have data, and you think, hey, this is really interesting, but half of this is to do with Romania or Italy or something, talk to someone, call them. Like, work together on projects. It's the, it's the best way forward. And I, I think while we can be competitive with each other, I think that we have to really trust each other too and that we should build up relationships because it's, it's not an easy job. Um, and we're not doing it for the amazing pay or the amazing hours, but because it's incredibly interesting and it's a worthy thing to do. So I, I do think that, like, find a buddy. Yeah. Um, just a small note on that, but because I think so, well, some of the ways in which I've seen crowdsourcing done incredibly well is through places that are um, organizations that are locally focused. So I think WNYC, for example, is a radio station in New York that has done a lot of really interesting crowdsourcing of data from the Cicada project, which was a project for which they made people build little sensors that would um, collect data on cicadas, like little bugs coming out of the ground, all the way to figuring out where there are bikes in the city that were left there. And I think even you can expand that to understanding, okay, are there toxic spills somewhere? Or are there things that are happening in your environment that we should know about? Um, Google Forms allows you to do that really simply. It puts it in a spreadsheet, and then you can start looking into those stories. It's not necessarily, again, statistically sound in a way that you can be like, these are the major findings. There's 70% of like Queens in New York is like full of like toxins as well. But it's a way of getting towards information that is otherwise not covered or not um, collected by other folks. I actually have one, I have one example of what's going on in Ireland at the moment. Um, there's an organization called the Referendum Transparency Initiative that we both know. And <laughs> they have been using a plugin from uh, Who Targets Me. And there is a referendum coming up in Ireland in about six weeks on uh, essentially abortion. Um, we've got one of the most restrictive uh, abortion uh, protocols in the world, and it, it's just about repealing the Eighth Amendment. 
And so this organization has been encouraging Irish people to install this plugin, Who Targets Me, and it's scraping Facebook ads. And so for the first time, we're seeing all these dark ads who are popping up that are targeting Irish voters. Um, and that, that's been really revealing in Ireland. It's really showing that there is a, there's a systematic problem in the way that the Irish government, we don't have rules to deal with this social media advertising. And so it's, it's causing a lot of people to think about like our government and our processes and really shining a light on something. Um, which brings me to the last point, and this is going to be the last co topic we discuss until we go to Q and A's, which is good. Um, scraping. So I think one of the most interesting things that I discovered when I first got into data journalism was, oh, I can make my own data sets by writing a little robot that goes out into the internet and grabs pieces of information and makes me a spreadsheet. And I think that's become a more sophisticated and more also like legally difficult um, place to navigate. I think it would be great for you guys to each. Um, talk about how you use scraping in your work and um, what the m biggest challenges are with scraping. Uh, this might be a long one. Um, <laughs> so I use, I say, in, in, my, in my company at the moment, we are scraping lots of government websites. Um, and government websites are highly variable. If you've ever come across a government website that uses a CAPTCHA, run a million miles away. Um, but I, I would say, like, it, it, it depends on jurisdictions, it depends on the culture sometimes of the organization that you're looking at. So I will scrape, say, a court's website for court judgments and litigation data. Um, and we'll write our own scripts to go in and grab that data repeatedly and track everything that's being, that's being published in real time. And then we'll use that to build our own API. Um, I think with, with scraping for, for something that you're trying, with some, with, in some ways you're trying to structure unstructured data. So there's lots of stuff being published on good websites, that's of value to lots of people. Particularly for me, it's, it's of value to lawyers. So you, you take something that's quite hard to use and you make it into something easy, and then you sell a service based on that. Which is, I think product development in that way is something that's sometimes missing in a, in a journalist mindset is about, well, is there a business to be built or a business model that would relate to our tasks about getting a story as well? Sometimes that might be the cherry on top if you're working on a story. The second experience I have is more controversial these days, um, is Facebook Cambridge Analytica related, <laughs> is when I was in Storyful, we, we were uh, a breaking news organization trying to understand breaking news on social media. So back in 2011, uh, 2012, we weren't scraping anything. We were using the publicly available APIs of Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and whatever other API was available in order to query for everything. So trying to understand breaking news in a social context involves uh, Twitter as being often your first port of call to see what's breaking, right? So understanding how an API works and then understanding how it works at scale and then understanding how you can pull data from an API like that repeatedly in order to detect either breaking news events, so event detection within a Twitter stream, and then relating that then in turn to an Instagram feed. I think a lot of people misunderstand or assume that what they see on twitter.com is, is, is what Twitter is, whereas I don't see it that way. I see Twitter is an API that happens to have a web interface on twitter.com. The underlying data is far more extensive, so it, if you're doing an API call against Twitter's API, you will see more detail, like creation date, or like, and same, same with YouTube. So we were, we were pulling uh, out of the YouTube API, we'd call it millions of times a day, looking for new videos coming from Syria, right? So we'd have long lists of YouTube accounts that we would monitor, plus we'd monitor for keywords coming in. As, as videos were being uploaded to YouTube, we would be mining YouTube's API, give us all new videos containing these keywords, right? Um, and I remember one specific example of this happening in the, in the uh, chemical weapons attack in 2013, where uh, we were mining, we were pulling all the new uploads as we did every day for years of new uploads coming from different YouTube accounts and different keywords we were monitoring against uh, Syria-related um, activities. And the YouTube API is a simple example. The YouTube API surfaces the upload time in UTC. So it tells you in universal time what time that video was uploaded at. And uh, after the chemical weapons attack in 2013, um, there was a lot of conspiracy theories, a bit like the current one, um, where I think the, the Russians were saying, oh, the, 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 the date is wrong, the, the time is wrong uh, on, on YouTube. It must be a hoax, it must be a setup. But, and that was Sergei Lavrov, as far as I remember, said that uh, in public. What 
the Russians didn't know was that the web UI of YouTube, so what you see on YouTube.com, is all in Pacific Standard Time. So the date is incorrect because it was uploaded in Syria at a specific time, so it looked like the wrong day, that the, the videos were being uploaded around 6 in the morning in, in Damascus. So we kind of, we, we put this out and we said, well, no, the dates are all correct and the times are all correct because you have to check the actual API, you have to go and see the actual upload time. And all the times were consistent for all the videos that were being uploaded by, by activists in Damascus after, the chemical, after and during the chemical weapons attack. The Russians kind of went silent after that. Lavrov kind of just, oh, we, that line was removed from the, the spin machine coming from, from the Russians. You see the same spin machine happening today when it comes to the recent chemical weapons attack. So I think understanding APIs first, then understanding what you can and can't do when you're interacting with them. So the changes that were made recently to Instagram's API have actually affected a lot of ways you can query uh, data. This has good and bad consequences because it's partly related to how Facebook was or was not behaving vis-a-vis -vis its API overall um, and what you can and can't access, um, which is a very important issue. Um, but I think for me, it was always about YouTube and Twitter were the fundamentals because they were essentially open networks by default. So you'd have YouTube would just share, you could see the videos being uploaded, and you, you were interested in certain accounts, you were interested in certain keywords, and you want to build lists. One of the key things we learned using, using uh, APIs was, I know that this YouTube account, and I verified its activity over the space of two years, that this person is based in a certain village or town in a certain area of Syria, right? We've been in touch with the person who's running that account. I need to monitor at scale lots of those accounts, and APIs are often the best way to do it, and then you're building systems to try and pull all that stuff in. Um, and I think that's the best, understanding how that stuff works is probably a huge opportunity within, uh, within journalism because once you understand how those social APIs work, then you can apply it across lots of other APIs. All right, let me summarize, summarize that again. So I think there's two ways that you talked about. Number one is getting data from websites, taking bits and pieces of a website and then structuring that using um, scrapers, basically code that you write that goes back yeah. and amasses over time a big trove of data. And the second one was APIs. APIs are a data stream that the company allows you to, um, that, that the company provides based on their services. So most of these social media companies, from Facebook to Twitter to um, Instagram, they offer data, a data stream based on what they want to offer you. Right? That means that for Facebook, um, you can get every, not every, but the majority of the posts that a page has ever published through an API, plus all the information that comes with it, metadata, when it was published, what the content was, how many comments it got, and so on, through that API. Um, and so basically understanding how these commercial data streams work and then leveraging them to archive your own massive troves of data based on lists of um, accounts that you're interested in is a way for you to then later do digital forensics to verify information, to find stories within like um, amplification networks and so on and misinformation. Yeah. Now you. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I don't have the same scraping experience as Gavin. Um, I work for a small investigative unit and so the first thing I'll always do is try find an API because I hate writing scrapers. <laughs> I know I should do it more. I know I should take more pride in it, but I'll always try find an API. Then if I'm really lazy, I'll try use like an automated scraper like import.io. And then after that, I kind of just go, okay, fine. And I'll, like, I'll go and break out my Python script and use requests for a beautiful soup. Or at the moment, I'm trying to learn a little bit of JavaScript and use Nightmare.js. Um, yeah, scraping is incredibly useful. It's really powerful. I recommend it's a great skill that I personally need to know more of, and I will make, I'll try work on that. Um, but yeah. Um, all right, so my job is basically going back and forth and finding online data. Um, as you guys know, one of my favorite things to say about working at BuzzFeed News is that we covered the internet before anyone else took it seriously, which is beautiful because now we have people who have spent seven years in a 4chan channel figuring out how the alt-right plans attacks, right? Um, and as this has moved further and further into the mainstream of politics, um, understanding how we can mine data from the social web has become more and more important, I think. Um, I'm actually writing a Python book on it. If anyone wants to learn it, it's aimed at beginners. I can share chapters with you. Um, 
But one of the things that I find interesting is that there is A, the API that you can get data from. So one of the things, uh, one of the ways in which, for example, you could find um, tweets from the president is to go to the API and request um, every tweet he's ever tweeted. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because companies like Twitter make their money through data, they restrict how much data you get. So that means that for, an AP for Facebook, Twitter, all of these other companies, they're like, I will give you a tiny sliver of what you want in terms of data, but I will charge you a ton for everything else, or I will retain that information for myself the same way Facebook does and monetize it for advertisements. So that's one of the, the, that's one of the biggest problems with APIs. Social media companies are only worth as much as the data they have on you. And so based on that, they only give you a tiny bit of it. What that means for journalists is that what you are talking about is we need to figure out a way of archiving this data over time. So that's become an interesting thing. Um, there's a guy on the internet who has um, archived 28,000 or maybe 30,000 of Donald Trump's 34,000-ish, I think, give or take, tweets because the API only gives you 3,200 tweets going backwards, right? And as more and more people on the web are starting to distort information universes, are starting to um, play with attention and virality for their own gain, um, it becomes more and more important to start tracking misconduct online. Yeah, and I, I think one of the issues that came up in the 2016 election and <laughs> since then, and what's, in, what's in, in interesting or intriguing to see is how Facebook's recent moves to allow researchers more access to understand what's going on on their own platform, and Twitter has announced the same thing. One of the barriers that we had uh, early on is Twitter actually has two APIs. It has a stream API and it has a REST API. The REST API is rate limited, so you can only do so many calls uh, per hour to try and understand stuff. And one of the things we were very interested in early on was understanding social graph relationships on Twitter to understand uh, group dynamics, right? So I did a couple of research papers on it. And because we were interested in understanding authoritative voices within Twitter networks. And oftentimes you would detect bot networks by accident uh, yeah. to, when, you're look, when you're querying that enough. But often the barrier, as you said, was rate, limit, rate limits as how you can understand the graph itself. Yeah. I think if, if Twitter is moving in a direction of working more closely with researchers about that, I think that's something that, that's quite interesting because there are a lot of bot networks. Yes. Um, so back to that, APIs give you a little bit of data. The other way of getting information from the social web is through something that is very much against the terms of services of each of these companies, scraping information from your Facebook account or other people's Facebook accounts. What's interesting is that you will see all this data displayed on the website, right? You log into facebook.com and you will see, okay, there are like 4,000 people who like this specific video stream. I wouldn't know every single person who's on there so that, that I can start looking for people who might be non-real humans who are deployed or being paid to amplify messages, something that's been become a very large problem. The issue with that is when we try to actually get that information from websites using a scraper that is very much against the terms of services of these companies. And that is uh, that has become a major barrier for a lot of journalists because um, in the US there's this lovely thing called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which um, um, bars you from breaching the terms of services and could result in, I think it's a felony? Uh, yes. Um, and uh, you could, for gathering information, be sued by a company like Facebook. But this is an interesting thing to wrestle with as we're trying to figure out how to understand the social web a little better. Um, and the last one that I, uh, last way in which I like thinking about data is like, um, I like to do something called a quantified selfie, where I ask people to access their own data and then hand it over to me in partnership. And we do anecdotal but still illustrative um, data work on here's how much data is uh, out there about you, and this is what I can tell about you based on that data. And so those are three ways in which I've used the web <laughs> for data collection. And, you, and actually related to that would be the use of subject access requests mm -hmm. by partners. So yeah. not just under the current data protection regime, but upcoming GDPR regime yes. is um, working with people who are interested in privacy and using subject access requests to pull data from 
companies yeah. or government yeah. about themselves and then using that to understand what's going on. Yeah, it's a really powerful request. Yeah. Like I recommend everybody use the subject access request. And then we can crowdsource that. <laughs> Anyhow, um, now we are going on to questions. Does anyone have a question? Down there, let's start with you. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Just. Okay. This is you. Okay. Did you pick a, a way to? Does it work? Yes. Yes. Did you pick a way to store the data uh, in uh, your newsrooms? Like a kind of GitHub for uh, data sets? Yeah, my newsroom, we have a private GitHub repo. And as well as that, we use a Postgres database that we store a lot of different data sets that like if we get through, uh, different, if I build it or if we get it through different FY things, yeah, we'll, we'll store it in there. And so like I can access it, um, my colleagues can access it, yeah. Did you build it yourself? Well, it's, it's just a Postgres database. So we had the infrastructure is free and then we just uploaded it. Um, and yes, I also use Postgres and Elastic uh, for storing all the data we scrape. And everyone can share it and like... It, it's private so within the newsroom, but yeah. 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 Because th that's a question we have. I, I don't know if everyone has the same question, but we're like, how can we like systematize our... Data? Oh, data management in general is a problem. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know it is. And like, I, I'm a big fan on these things of like legacy databases where like you keep scraping the same thing over and over and over again and you keep building it and building it and, re and reporting on the story over and over and investing into you know these data sets rather than just putting all these resources into one story, having a big front page, bam, and then next thing you kind of end up chucking it aside unless there's a legal issue. So uh, yeah, I think like maintaining data is really important and writing proper documentation so that even if you leave, other people can pick up that story. Maybe it changes two years later. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of the newsrooms currently are doing this themselves. So they're looking up tutorials on Google and figuring out, okay, how do I put together, um, how do I pull data every single day, put it in a spreadsheet and update it. And so there's various tutorials that you can use. I think a lot of people use an EC2 instance if you want to Google something um, that then hooks up a script that you write oftentimes in Python, um, sometimes in Ruby, depending on who you are. <laughs> um, to then pull that data, update your spreadsheet, and then make that an automated process over time. Right now, it sounds like, I, I can't think of a tool, unless anyone else can, that's like, uh, uh, what you see is what you get, is what, what you're looking for, like a software that makes it easy for people to do that on a daily basis. I have heard that S3, the Amazon um, server space, is starting to experiment with ways that makes it a little easier for you to set this kind of stuff up. But data polls on a regular basis right now are still done by very specialized people in newsrooms who know the languages that you require to do them. Um, a lot of that is backend languages. Um, so I think Python, again, Ruby is a good one, and, uh, but mostly Python. In the journalism community, it sounds like Python is becoming more and more, on a global level, um, a language that people are learning and working with to do this kind of work. Um, I'm also biased. <laughs> yes, in the back. Hey. There, oh yeah, you have a microphone. Is this on? Cool. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm Joseph Cox from Vice's Motherboard. Um, what's the process look like for actually sharing data from one newsroom to the other? Because we work with a lot of data that was obtained illegally mm. by hackers and our lawyers don't let us do that. Mm -hmm. And then with all this Cambridge Analytica stuff, and you mentioned APIs, maybe Instagram close it off. How is this going to impact OSINT and journalism in the long term when we have a lot of this hype, a lot of this paranoia, and maybe more APIs are going to get closed off? Do you guys want to start? <sighs> okay, so I'll, I'll start with like how to share data. Um, you need to have a newsroom, you re another newsroom you really trust. Um, after that, you sit down and like sometimes you have like a written agreement about what you will and will not do. Um, when it comes to sharing, um, it depends how sensitive the data is. Uh, I know of newsrooms who have used Google Drive to share data with other newsrooms. I know of other ones who've like had air gap computers where you're like going through with keys. Uh, I know the ICAJ have like a centralized system where everybody has a special password and they log on. So like it changes enormously. But I think the really important thing is just to think about 
who's going to access it, what are your security threats, um, is this something where you're looking at industry or is it something where like the NSA are after you? Mm -hmm. So and to, to like evaluate that and to respond to it. Um, also use encrypted communications as well, like always. Um, and share all the documentation, make sure that you're completely on level and have like constant communication as well. Um, I really recommend Signal as well as a way of communicating uh, privately. Uh, um, I really like the work that um, the OCC or OCCRP are doing with Aleph, their open source database mm. uh, query system. And they have a really nice search engine now that contains an awful lot of data that comes from multiple databases and they're trying to take that kind of unified approach. I think to answer your other question, I think it's just really hard. Yeah. There's no easy answers yeah. um, for how individual newsrooms handle certain situations. Yeah. Um, some newsrooms will be more conservative than others legally, some less so, some more so. So I just think there's, there's it's, it's, a lot of this stuff is still being worked out. Some editors are still figuring out why Facebook's such a big story. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's a really hard thing and not a lot of journalists really understand it completely. Like I, I, you, I don't get it completely. Um, and trying to explain that like it's a database where there's you know, two billion people on earth in it. Of course this is gonna be a huge problem. Um, where are we gonna move forward? Um, it's, it's a tough one to answer. Um, two things about data sharing. I love our data editor, Ed Busby, because he has very, um, a very clear vision on how he likes to share data. And oftentimes, it's um, the, our analysis, just for the sake of transparency, should be replicable by anyone. So our raw data, if it's anonymized, ends up being online as a CSV, as a spreadsheet. And then we have Jupyter Notebooks, which is basically an interface for Python that um, allows you to run specific scripts on the same analyses. And you should be able to get to the same conclusions that we are based on that data. Every larger data, se uh, data story that contains data that we got through FOIAs or through other means that is otherwise has not been published or that has otherwise not been gathered in that format, we publish on our GitHub, so look at github.com slash BuzzFeed News, and then you should see everything there. There's a bunch of different things from the EEOC data that we got about sexual harassment all the way to um, uh, Craig Silverman and I have done a collaboration where we looked into um, hyperpartisan news organizations, and a whole full list of um, these hyperpartisan news organizations is there. So if you want to look into left and right leaning organizations on Facebook, um, all of the data is online. When it comes to anonymizing or making sure that we protect the privacy of, um, of, our, of the data, um, uh, of the people mentioned in the data, one of the, my favorite things that BuzzFeed recently updated in their ethics policy is, oops, um, is that they added a, um, a clause about amplification through publication into their ethics policy. So Shawnee Hilton has written a piece about um, ethics and one of the things that I really love in there is comes from our general um, assistant general counsel, Nabiya Sayyid. She, you should follow her. She's an incredible person when it comes to freedom of speech issues. But she um, wrote up a really wonderful piece about the policy looking into just because something's public doesn't mean it deserves to be amplified by a media organization. And just because we have the power to bring a post that was posted to 200 friends maybe, that is public, um, to millions of people, doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it with uh, their uh, privacy and safety in mind. And those are things that I always guide myself by. Who is my subject? What are they facing? And to what extent is it in the public interest, right? Because uh, it's one thing to out someone who, um, let's say I've done a lot of international reporting, so it's one thing to out someone who um, publicly states something about how they don't like the president in the US. It's another to do that in a place where there are much more restrictive governments that could subject people to actual physical harm. And so those are case by case um, um, uh, decisions we made and um, most of the time we err on the safe side of like, let's make sure this person doesn't get harmed. And I do this, like I do a lot of quantified selfies where I look into people's relationships and I make sure that the people who consented to give me the data and the people who are in the periphery of that will not be harmed. Like those folks will not be harmed. I, I take every precaution I can to make sure that everyone on the outside is not gonna be dragged into this. That make sense?
Yeah, and also um, another thing about vulnerable subjects, I've done a lot of data research on people who are like um, refugees, people who are um, um, socioeconomically like less uh, uh, disenfranchised. So one of the biggest things that I worry about oftentimes is that, do you actually know, thanks five minutes, um, what you're getting yourself into when I'm amplifying this, right? I've like gone into refugee camps a long time here at my border and it wasn't, it's not, it's when you say, oh, are you gonna be on camera? Sure, they might not understand mm. what it means to be on camera for the Wall Street Journal across yeah. like an entire region. And so keeping in mind the perspective of your subjects is for me the key and making sure that you're not doing what Facebook does and doing what Cambridge Analytica does. That make sense? Okay. Last question, five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.